Hi, I'm Mike Fear. Welcome to Now You're Cooking. Um, you all well know um, we're the Mid Coast Premier Cookware Store right on Front Street in Bath. And um, tonight we have a special uh, wine edition. Um, what I'm going to do before I introduce our speaker tonight, I just want to remind you that this Sunday is Pi Day, March 14th. And the reason I mention it to you is because we will have 15% off everything related to pies. So come and join us for Pi Day. And now today, uh, we are very fortunate here at Now You're Cooking to have um, a great wine collection. And one of the reasons we have a great wine collection is because we have a great wine guru. And so I'd like to introduce Joel Hatch. And he's right here and he's going to tell you about what we're doing tonight. Good evening. Uh, welcome to our first virtual wine tasting. Uh, we've had everything on pause for a while for obvious reasons and we're excited to to dip our uh, our noses back in the glass. Tonight we're going to do Austrian wine and um, we're actually going to uh, do three different wines um, from three different parts of Austria, two of which are very very traditional and classic and one of which is a very uh, experimental and sort of cutting edge. So, um, welcome to the Austrian wine tasting. So, what are we going to do first, uh, Joel? We've uh, gonna... Well, we're going to start in Vienna um, with a wine that is called uh, Gemischtersatz, Wiener Gemischtersatz, which just means basically a mixed wine from Vienna, more specifically a, uh, a uh, what they call a field blend. So, a Gemischtersatz is a as a vineyard site that is actually planted with a bunch of different varieties to, uh, together, so co-planted. They're harvested all at the same time, even if some of them aren't exactly ripe and some of them are a little overripe, so you get a lot of variety uh, in the blend that way. And they're fermented together all at the same time. And this is a very traditional style in Vienna. And yes, when I say in Vienna, I mean literally in the city, there are these vineyards. So. Um, so this wine is a, a kind of a, uh, a tavern wine uh, that you'll find in Vienna with a whole bunch of different types of food, particularly things like schnitzel uh, and things like that. And if you're wondering, actually. And these, these um, grapes are, are pretty much unknown grapes. To well, some the of them of are, are well known and uh, some of them are not. There are about 11 varieties in this wine. Um, there's uh, Riesling, Chardonnay, Gruner, Veltliner, and Pinot Blanc are all well known. The other ones, which I'm not going to bother listing, are ones you will never see by themselves, um, almost never anyways. Um, so anyways, if you want to look at the map, all of the important wine growing regions in Austria are on the eastern side of the country. And here in Vienna is where we're starting, where that blue dot is. And we're going to start there and go up the Danube River all the way to the uh, city of Dernstein, which is in right around here. Um, so if you're following uh, the geography of this. <laughs> All right, let's check it out. This is a two, two, 2017 Wieninger, Wiener Gemischtersatz, which if you can say that three times quickly. <laughs> Have another drink. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and I think the nose is really complex because of that... Um, that mixed harvest where you get really ripe uh, aromas, but you also get green aromas mm. kind of mixed in and, and playing off of each other um, yeah, as almost a counterpoint, which I find very interesting. High acid, a lot of stony minerality. And the fruit is, um, is also very diverse, little hints of tropical, hints of stone fruit. Um, a lighter bodied wine. What do you think, Mike? I, I, I really enjoy it. Um, I'm just wondering, is it, is it good for fish? Um, would you eat uh, chicken with it? What's, what's, um, or would you just drink it on its own? Just as I a... think it's a great food wine, especially. Um, and yeah, I think I can picture it with chicken, fish. I, I like having it with uh, pork schnitzel, mm. Um, mm. which is really easy to make and very quick to make. Um, and, but a lot of uh, sort of um, that lighter uh, sort of tavern fare, fried foods, because mm -hmm. the acid in that will cut through the fat. Um, 
So, um, yeah. And um, number two, tell us a little bit about that one. So, so now what I thought would be fun is we have this Gemischer Zatz, which I explained what that is and, and, and how traditional it is. The next one um, it comes from a uh, winery called Yurchich. Sophie and Alvin uh, Yurchich um, produced some very traditional wines in Camptal, which is up the river, up the Danube River from Vienna. And they, among the, uh, on the side, I should say, of the traditional wines that they do, they do a little project every year um, called, I think it's called Discoveries from the Winery. And um, they'll do different experimental things like they do a, a, a Gruner Veltliner made as an orange wine, uh, things like that. Well, the Mont Blanc is basically a, uh, a take on a Gemischterzatz because it's, um, a collection of white varietals that are co-fermented at the same time and harvested together and everything. And, um, but the difference here is that they're co-fermented in a big open uh, wooden barrel uh, on the native yeasts, so no inoculated yeasts, and they, they are left on the skins for about two weeks, um, So which is what you do if you're making orange wine. So it's sort of... Um, in this current trend of natural winemaking, orange wine, um, experimental wines, low intervention wines. Um, it's that version of a Gemischterzatz. So um, you can see there's more color to it. If you put them next to each other, that darker color comes from that extra skin contact. Um, and I think if we get to the bottom of the bottle at some point later in the night, you'll find some <laughs> bits and pieces. <laughs> some bits and pieces, <laughs> some chunks. Yeah. So um, um, on the nose, I, is it floral or is it? Uh, yeah, I definitely get floral. I also uh, usually with these kind of skin contact white wines, I get tea notes. So mm -hmm. like jasmine, you mm -hmm. get any tea notes? I, I didn't know whether I was influenced by the flowers on the label, but. <laughs> I think a, that uh, the suggestion is pretty clear. Um, but yeah, a, a lot of the wild fermented things I find, I get a lot of um, really forward aromatics and a lot of times floral aromatics uh, aromatics that remind me of you know pollen and uh, yeah so a lot more <clears throat> wow yeah you don't um, the first one had that minerality and you don't get quite so much with this one um, it's um, I also That's think the really, mouthfeel is really different. It is. So it this is, is really clean and pure, mm -hmm. the, uh, the Gemischterzatz, and the Mont Blanc has more texture to it. Mm -hmm. um, almost makes the tongue tingle. Um, and that is, again, from no fining and filtration. There's no filtration on this wine. And the, the wild fermenting, the skin, skin contact, all of that stuff. Mm. So, oh, that's so good. Um, and while we're um, just talking about different varietals, we've, we've, we've done a couple that have several varietals in them. Do you have a favorite grape from Austria or is it hard it's, to... It's definitely <laughs> hard to say. I'm, anyone who knows me at all knows that I'm a little wild on uh, Austrian wine. Um, so I like all the Austrian wines, really. Uh, I mean, one of the things I love about Austrian wine is that the quality to price ratio beats so many other areas. I mean, you just find such high quality through, uh, from top to bottom at any price point, really. And even the very serious wines top out at, you know, $40, $50, you're getting really top wines, whereas other regions, forget it, you're in the hundreds. So it's a great value area, but it's also qualitatively has a very high standard that they work to. Um, and so to get back to yeah. favorite varietal, uh, the two favorite varietals are probably no surprise for anyone who drinks Austrian wine. That'd be Riesling and Gruner Veltliner. Mm -hmm. um, and oddly enough, I don't have a Gruner Veltliner here, but um, this last one is a Riesling. Mm -hmm. and it's a really classic Riesling. We're going back to a very classic style. We've gone up the river from Vienna to Camptal, and now we go further up the river to um, a town called Dernstein, which um, is a very has a very deep history 
Um, anyone who knows their, their English history, like this guy over here, <laughs> knows which king was held captive there, right? Oh, I, probably Richard the Lionheart. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, in the 12th century, Richard the Lionheart was uh, held captive there, and the ruins of the castle are still there in D Dernstein. And uh, above the city um, are these terraces where uh, on, the, on the steep, steep hillsides uh, that were made by... Um, Benedictine monks in the same century mm. um, when they first planted these vineyards um, probably to Riesling and other varietals um, so some of these uh, terrace slopes actually go back that far this wine is from Dernstein in an area called the Wachau which has an interesting um, it has its own system of classification if you look at the label here if you want to zoom in on this you'll see it has the name of the town, Dernstein, the name uh, Riesling of the grape, and then it has this word Federspiel. Um, Federspiel refers to the ripeness of the grapes at harvest and the potential alcohol that um, the sugars in, present in the grape uh, can produce. There's three different levels of ripeness that uh, the Wachau wines actually have defined. Um, Steinfader, which is uh, anywhere up to 11.5% alcohol, so very light, delicate uh, wines, uh, named after the, um, the light grass, uh, feathery grass that grows there. And then this one, which is Federspiel, is um, wines up to 12.5% alcohol. And these are more classically styled, a little riper, more full, more uh, uh, complete, if you will. Um, the name Federspiel actually uh, comes from an ancient term from falconry, um, which was popular in the area, probably also in the 12th century. <laughs> um, so this Riesling uh, is uh, from really, really old slopes uh, above Dernstein. And... Um... I sort of think this might be, being it's a Riesling, it might uh, go well with a schnitzel, perhaps. Oh, yeah. um, that, that would be uh, a, a Wiener schnitzel or... Uh, this would also go with Asian food, mm -hmm. I think. Not the super spicy stuff, but definitely something with a little um, warm spice to it. Mm. That's typically, um, if somebody's looking for something to go with Thai food, or something, um, even curries, uh, a Riesling is really excellent for, for, for that type of thing. Yeah. Um, people think about Riesling, um, and they usually think of German wine. Mm. And this couldn't be more different from German mm. Riesling in a lot of ways. Um, and one of them is that um, the particular types of soil here in Wachau um, are basically primary rock covered in uh, Los. Um, which is a mix of sand and, and clay and it basically um, the really savory almost umami flavors um, that kind of take over the the Riesling characteristic are folded into a texture which is really you don't find elsewhere not even mm. in, in other parts of Austria the wines of Vaca and this goes for the Gruner as well have this really kind of almost uh, silky, mm -hmm. rich texture to them, even the Federspiel level. And if you go to the next level, which is uh, of ripeness, which is Smaragd, named after the little green lizards, um, then they become really powerful. But yeah. again, have that really lush, creamy, uh, almost buttery, uh, smooth quality. I think uh, what I would say about drinking this uh, Riesling is it's one to put in the hand of somebody who says, oh, I don't like Riesling, it's too sweet. Exactly. Um, it's just not too sweet. It's just absolutely um, it's dry and it's yep. lovely. It's yep. got all the... Yeah, all of these mm. will be totally fermented dry also. Um, and But they'll also present more dry. Like even yeah. in Germany, you'll, you'll have a Riesling that's a trocken, that's a totally dry Riesling. But for some reason, because of the nature of the way the fruit expresses... Um, people will say, oh, that's sweet. Um, but they don't tend to say that when you get this in the glass. They can feel that like really almost saline uh, minerality and that that's umami, savory quality. Well, thank you so much for 
um, sharing all this with us tonight, Joel. Um, I hope uh, you've all been um, educated, and if you have any questions, uh, you can come into the store and you can ask Joel or you can ask me or you can send questions in. Um, we hope that uh, you'll come to our next tasting. Uh, we'll, we'll try to do another one um, in, in, you know, in fairly soon. And um, also, don't, re don't forget, we still have pie day on Sunday. Um, you want pie dishes, you want uh, anything to make your pastry, 15% off, and you can buy these wines when you come in uh, to get your special on pies. And they're still on discount through Sunday. The wines are all still yes. on discount through Sunday also. So um, we'll look forward to seeing you. Thank you very much for watching, and we'll bid you a, a good night.